Good morning to everyone out there. I uh, hope you're okay. It is still morning. It's 1030 a.m. here. I'm at St. Columns Episcopal Church in Ridgeland, Mississippi, and my name is C.J. Metters, uh, the rector here at St. Columns. Happy to have you with us. We're trying something new in this uh, Sunday School hour, <laughs> Sunday School Christian Ed hour that we've been doing here at St. Columns. Uh, rebooting with what we're calling Holy Talk, a chance for us to talk together. Uh, and I want to open it up more and more to have actual folks with me in dialogue and not just uh, comments on a Facebook. But good morning, Vicki. I see you there. Thank you for being here with us. I uh, just want us to be able to kind of talk about where we are in light of recent events, uh, in light of the discord in our society and our country and so just kind of opening up the conversation and trying to keep Christ in mind remembering that we are unified in Christ as Christ's body uh, as God's people and so how do we how do we do that how do we open up a conversation and so today is going to be about framing the conversation today is going to be about making a covenant to participate in dialogue and do so in a respectful and even holy way, holy talk after all. And so we're, we're beginning today, and I wanted to start us off with a prayer that I love. Remember this thing? I know y'all have some at home. This is our prayer book in our Episcopal tradition. I uh, wanted to start us off with a prayer. Um from this prayer book, and it is a prayer for the human family. And let me make sure that I can get this going for y'all. And this is how it goes. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Look with compassion upon the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love. And work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I love that prayer because I think it says a lot. Uh, the first thing it says is that we are a human family. That regardless of where you come from, where you're born, the color of your skin, ethnicity, nation, tribe, whatever it may be, whatever distinction that there is, we're all part of the same family. It's been a hard, hard lesson uh, for us to learn and a hard thing to believe and there is resistance, active resistance to that message uh, out there today. Uh, it's still there and it's here on the internet and it's out there in the world uh, being proclaimed and I believe as a church it's our responsibility to bear the light of the message of the human family and that we are all God's people, all created in God's image and all redeemed by God's Son, at least on the path toward redemption. At least that's where we're trying to be. And so that's the message. That's the radical message, if you will, of our time, is to say we are one human family. We are uh, God's people, and we're all looking to go in the same direction. And so that's, that's what I wanted to share. And, you know, all of that stuff and that prayer about arrogance and hatred which infects our hearts. I'm kind of bringing me to my first question here, and it's, whoops, that's not it. Sorry, everybody. It's this question. How do we have respectful, productive conversations on social media? So I'm going to put that question out there. I'm going to Make sure that I can see everybody. I see that Ann Michael is here, Mary Margaret's here, Jim's here, and Ann, Elizabeth, Derryberry. Good to see y'all. I, I want to 
I want to talk about this, and I hope maybe y'all have a comment. Um, how do we have respectful, productive conversations on social media? And I'm thinking about this part of the prayer that says, arrogance and hatred which infects our hearts. And I'm thinking about how many times I have read a comment on social media and immediately felt like I knew better, arrogance, uh, and immediately felt like a, a bitterness and a wave of, of emotion to say something uh, and to speak uh, from a place of bitterness. And you know, hatred's a strong word, but I would say that you know, borderline hatred uh, of you know, just, just this emotional response to a post. And I know that many of us and I, I try to do this. I've seen some comments about this, of, you know, resisting that urge. And maybe that's an initial step. Re resisting the urge to speak from that place, um, to speak from that place of, of arrogance and hatred. And it's a tough thing to do, right? You have to physically, like, get your phone out of the way, get your computer out of the way, and, and pull away. Um there's, and this is what Jim says, a good start might be not to react immediately, but to wait a bit and consider your response. Hey, Virginia, good to see you here. It's been a while, Virginia. I'm glad you're here with us. Uh, so yeah, not immediately responding, uh, kind of sitting with it, um, and not letting it consume you. And here's, here's another thing that I have read recently, and we, we've been reading an EFM We've been reading Sabbath by Heschel. And the wonderful thing about that book is that it says the Sabbath was made for us to surpass technology. I'm going to bring it, uh, bring it here for a second and, and make that point again. The Sabbath was made for us to surpass technology. A, a day when all of the labor, all of the busyness, all of the technological advance stops uh, and you just kind of sit in the beauty of holiness uh, in the beauty of creation itself and reflect meditate appreciate all of those things uh, and the sabbath that's what the sabbath was made for and i love that phrase he uses to surpass technology and not letting technology consume us uh, but letting it uh having a life independent from it. Um, here we go. We got another comment from Sharon. Remember, if you chose to post something that is controversial, someone is going to fire back. So think twice before you post. And that's, that, that gets to, you know, what are, what are our intentions when we post something? Um, honestly, I can be honest about this. My intention, uh, is partially to you know get some likes, get some people commenting on it, uh, to have some responses, to see when I pick up my phone that there's a notification that somebody has commented on uh, on something that I posted, and so it's there's there's definitely an egotistical aspect to my social media interaction. I feel confident saying that that's probably true for many of us. Um, but then, you know, if you're going to post something that's controversial, someone's going to fire back. And, and so are you ready for that? And if you are, are you ready to do it in a, in, and engage in a respectful way? Do you think that this is something that's actually uh, beneficial for society or is it just something that's uh, driving the wedge even deeper? It's a good comment, Sharon. Thanks. So, yeah, I, I, I'm reading this Heschel book and... Um, I don't have it with me, but I wish I did. And the book is really great. I mean, just the, the idea for me of, of taking a Sabbath, and I've heard that there are tech uh, CEOs and, and people that work in tech, the tech industry who know exactly how engrossing technology can be that have all of their families engaged in a no-screen day. And so I'm thinking about no-screen Sabbaths, at least for Lent. <laughs> I'm putting it off until Lent, but thinking about those days where you can just set the phone down, turn it off. Uh, and, you know, Heschel says, have no external obligations on the Sabbath. Sounds nice. 
All right. Do you think anyone ever changes their opinion based on what's posted on Facebook? I, I don't. Um, I, I think, you know, obviously it could happen here and there, but I think that most of what it does is kind of deepens the divide or gets us more entrenched in our own place, especially given the tone and rhetoric. I, I, I think that there can be a way to present yourself as vulnerable, as uh, searching, as humble, as engaged in a dialogue in which if I am open to change and I'm open to really listening, um, then that that can happen. I mean, you know, the fiery opinions and the, you know, the tone, fiery tone and the rhetoric, it's not going to do it. I mean, but if you if you open yourself up in a way to say like, to the best of my knowledge, and based on my limited understanding and research, uh, this is what I think. But I'm open to other other suggestions. I mean, you know, it's not not really what you hear out there, but maybe it could be part of it. All right, next question. Well, I, I want to get into this. This is uh, something that we use in EFM, and I think it's a, a helpful tool for respectful communication and it's from the Kaleidoscope Institute and I just want to show y'all for a second the Kaleidoscope Institute has been doing this work for a long time spearheaded by the work of Eric Law who's written a lot of things on church communities and boundaries and, and how to be inclusive but not so inclusive that you lose yourself and, and having kind of porous boundaries and a lot of, a lot of run, wonderful work from him and uh, just want to show you this real quick kaleidoscope institute here you can find them on the web by googling kaleidoscope institute i had to, i'm not very good at spelling kaleidoscope it turns out um for diverse sustainable communities training leaders to create gracious space for courageous conversation and consulting to heal and transform local organizations and so you can get a coach you can do an accreditation training. You know, this is this is a tool, really, to help you figure out how to have these these difficult conversations. Um, and so, I wanted y'all to know about the Kaleidoscope Institute. That's uh, a link there. And then uh, I want to get us back over here and to look at these these respectful communication guidelines. And say so this can be a, this is an offering of one way, and it doesn't all apply to social media. Um, some of it is thinking about when we're, you know, in conversation with one another gathered around, which I know we all miss because Zoom is not the real, the real deal. Um, but how to, how to have that respectful dialogue in conversation with one another. And so some of it applies to uh, Facebook and, and some of it doesn't. So let's, let's walk through that together. The first is R, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Take responsibility for what you say and feel without blaming others. This is the, the gist of um, what I have felt for a long time in my own messaging and, and, and my own ministry and tried to, tried to say is that so often the first thing that we do is this, and, and it's, that's a part of that, what the prayer said about that arrogance, you know, that, that first move being this. Uh, that first move is, is how could you, how could the world be this way? Um, and instead, taking responsibility means the first thing that I do is point the finger at myself. And I, and I just think that that's such a natural human way of being, uh, is that first step to point the finger. Um, and the interesting thing is to me that in our, in our book, in our Bible, in our story of humanity, Humanity has always been sinful. Humanity has always fallen short. Humanity has always kind of distorted the goodness that we've been given from God. And it's like when we point the finger out there, we're saying, uh, uh, how could you? Can you believe this? Uh, how could the world be this bad? When it's kind of always been that way, and sin has always been present, and so just being surprised by sin to the extent that you are uh, aghast and um, 
you know, just taken back by it. Now, no doubt that sin always finds a way and the evil in this world does still find a way to surprise us. But that people fall short, that people are, uh, take up fancy, not fancy, just terrible ideas and uh, conspiracy theories and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just, it's just part of who we are. And, and so we need to be a little bit more understanding. And then the first thing to do, obviously, is take responsibility for what you say and feel without blaming others. And we know that when we become uh, angry and upset, we say things that we shouldn't, and we say things that are not as measured, uh, and sometimes things that are words that are meant to hurt, right? And so taking responsibility for that and saying, yeah, I did that, I said that, uh, and when I did, I was angry, and I'm responsible for what I say. Um, let's see. Chick-fil-A stands strong in honoring the Sabbath. You're right. I like that about them, for sure. Except that every time I want Chick-fil-A and think to myself, it's Sunday, right? And that's okay. I can respect what they do. Uh, okay, so let's see. That's that's respect uh, with the R. Use empathetic listening. I don't think that there's, for me, there's not a, a more um, effective way of really listening to someone um, and really trying to understand someone than using empathy. And I don't know that there's a, a better human quality out there and a quality that can do so much good than empathy. And empathy is saying, I have walked in your shoes before when it comes to um, what you're going through now. And it's not a one-up. It's not that you are constantly sharing that, oh, well, you had this bad thing happen to you. Let me tell you about what happened to me. Uh, it's not that. It's that when you're listening, connecting to that emotion that's being uh, communicated and saying, oh, I felt that way too. Let me listen even deeper because when I felt that way, you know, I, I knew it was a tough time for me. So, you know, it's not exactly sharing that explicitly it's just about like training your ear to hear the emotion behind that and the emotion that you felt before and the circumstances that you've been through before and then your your listening becomes much more compassionate um, your listening uh, has a deeper understanding I, th I just think that you know I mean when we post on Facebook things that are political uh, you know, things things that we see going wrong with the world and we should, this is how we think it should be remedied or this is who we think should be held accountable, which is justified at times. There is, there is justice uh, and there are things to be held accountable for, no doubt. Uh, but at the same time, the place that we're coming from uh, is a place of kind of fear of uncertainty and instability. I see the world going wrong in this way. I'm afraid of what the future holds if it continues to go this way. We all feel that, right? And so that's the that's the emotion, that's the feeling that's being communicated behind, you know, I think that this particular politi political figure should be, you know, banned from the discussion. Whatever, you know, the, the emotion behind that is a, a kind of anger and a fear, right? And so we have that same feeling we're going to communicate it in a different way if we've got a different worldview, political view. But the important thing, you know, what if a comment said, sounds like you're, you're uncertain about the future. It sounds like you're scared. Me too. Like, how, how can we figure out, you know, a path for healing for both of us? Um, and, you know, having more faith uh, in each other and those kind of things. So, I mean, just, just that empathetic listening, I, I don't think that there's anything more important than that, that quality and that ability. And I think I, I put a lot of faith in human ability to be empathetic, and really this is the, the path toward compassion for me. Sensitive to differences in communication styles. And this is a good one because this, this is going to require patience of us as we listen to each other, as uh, people speak differently, I have a tendency to 
I don't know, sometimes circle around and say the same thing over and over. Uh, sometimes I do that. Sorry. Uh, I know that there are other people out there that are short and to the point um, and say it quickly. And, you know, there's that air that's left in the room after it's said. And is that all you're going to say? Okay, well, all right. Well, uh, that's what you've said, you know. And, and, and so the difference is in communication styles. And of course, there there are folks that uh, there are folks that just communicate in ways that are uh, how would you say meandering, <laughs> right? And that's great, you know. I mean, everybody has their own communication style, and be sensitive to those differences. And while you're listening, you feel yourself saying, "Oh my God, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can listen." Right? Back up, take a deep breath, be patient. Uh, and let, let the person communicate uh, in their own communication style. It's tough stuff, but I mean, it, it's good practice and patience. Ponder what you hear before you speak. Yeah, right? You've heard that since you were young. Think about what you say uh, before you say it. So especially if you know, you're having an emotional response to something that's being said, you disagree with it, um, ponder what you hear, think what you... We don't have to go to this one. Everybody knows this one, right? Think before you speak. And this, I think this one is kind of take, piggybacks off of that one and takes it to the next level. Examine your own assumptions and perceptions. Now, you know, as a, let's go ahead and say it, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant male, um, they're going to be, uh, with the experience of growing up in the South, uh, having gone to a private school, um, having gone to seminary, everything that I've experienced and all the things that, you know, happen in my echo chamber and all the values that I have, uh, there are going to be things that I hear that are going to trigger me and trigger emotional response in me. There are going to be things that, um, you know, when it's, especially when it comes to, for me, just to share openly, when people talk about pick yourself up by your bootstraps and all of the world comes down to individual responsibility and it's all on you to do it yourself. Uh, for me, that, that gets me going, right? That's, that's something I'm like, wait, what about, what about the community? What about, you know, the fact that we all depend on one another and, you know, none of us could have really gotten to this level of independence without help from our parents and our community and our schools and all those kind of things. Anyway, uh, that's one of the places where I'm going to get, you know, you say that kind of thing to me and I'm going to, it's going to spark something in me. What are your assumptions and perceptions? What are the things that are going to, you know, put a trigger in you? And, and if you know those things that come up, you say, all right, well, somebody said something that sounds like Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, uh, you know, this is to, to expand on what I'm saying. Um, I know when somebody says that, okay, they said that. I know that I have a response to that. I don't have to comment on that all the time, every time. And I don't have to be a broken record when it comes to that. And so when you examine your own perceptions, it's about listening. It's about the ability to kind of not to jump in uh, and divert the discussion in another way uh, and take it off on, on a tangent, um, which can happen. So it's about examining your own assumptions and perceptions. Now, this one is interesting because, you know, in the context of social media, <laughs> there's not much confidentiality. It's kind of the point. Uh, but certainly, you know, those places where I think that the dialogue can go deeper and be, you know, that empathy can be more uh, resonant and, and, and felt more are those places where you can share the things that are going on really in your life and and share, you know, some of the more vulnerable things about who you are, how you feel uh, about experiences in your life. And so there is a place certainly for confidentiality. And I think that within this respectful guidelines framework, you know, it's super important given uh, some holy talk that happens certainly in ministry at the church and all those kind of things. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, for social media, it's a little bit different. Like, are you comfortable putting this thing out there uh, for everybody? To see, and so that it becomes it becomes different. The content becomes different. So it's it's probably less about 
uh, your experiences and, you know, kind of the traumatic experiences of your life. You know, I have seen people post that kind of stuff on Facebook. Uh, and to me, it's, it's less appropriate for you know, Facebook than it would be for, you know, other settings. So, um, anyway, just, you know, thinking about confidentiality and its place, you know, it has a place in our, in our discussions most definitely and in our ministry most definitely, but it doesn't really apply too much about so, for social media. And I like this one. This one says, trust uh, ambiguity. We're not here to debate who's right and wrong. That's a place, I think, another place, Jim, where we can actually affect some change if we were to have this mentality. You know, how many discussions have you had sitting around the fire, sitting around a dinner table, and, you know, with somebody that you can really discuss things with, um, and you've, you've really shared how you feel, you've gotten to the end of the conversation, and you say, well... I guess it's still just as messy as it was before we started this. Or you make the joke about, yeah, well, now we've solved all the world's problems. You know, there's always going to be ambiguity. There's always going to be that where, oh, yeah, well, there's there's a lot to do. There's, there's a lot of complexity out there. You know, in the Episcopal Church, we talk about the gray areas, uh, how it's not always black and white. It, it, there's a lot of gray and there's a lot of in-between. That's always going to be there, and and so knowing that that's going to be there, it becomes less and less about I'm right, you're wrong, right? And it becomes about this is the best that we're trying to do together to work toward a common good and, and truth. Um, and so my personal opinion about all this is that, uh, and I, I don't maybe this won't be too controversial, but I'll, I'll say this is that I believe that. Human beings in general don't have access to the kind of uh, objective truth that it would take to say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, when it comes to how we should live or some kind of ethical principle, this is the way and the only way because it's written in stone, it's written uh, in, in the universe. You know, it may be so that the moral rules are written in the universe, but I don't think that we can see them clearly. And so, like, Richard Hooker would say, to bring it back in, you know, we're all approaching the divine law, but seeing it with human eyes. And so we, how we relate to the truth is always, for me, and moral truths in, in this way, it's always, uh, we've got to be humble in what we can know. So, all right, I've talked a lot. I've walked through this thing. Um, and now the question that I want to get us to is, is this. You know, with these with these respectful guidelines in mind, I want to hear from you about what we can safely discuss together. So, some topics that we can do as we started off our last class. I asked you to think about theologians. This time, I'm asking you to think about what kind of topics you think that we can do this together in this space, uh, and perhaps invite some of y'all to to Zoom and and. And we can broadcast it on Facebook, too, just to say and provide an example for those out there of, of people who are committed to, you know, religious dialogue, but also Christian ethical dialogue about issues in the world. Um, one of the ones that I'm going to put out there and I want to do next week is the vaccine. Um, and I know that there, you know, with any vaccine, there are anti-vaxxers. Uh, there are people out there who are nervous about taking this uh, COVID-19 vaccine because they're worried about the side effects. Um, and all of that is a natural, natural fear. And I think that anyone who takes it has some degree of uncertainty. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the vaccine and we talk about uh people's opinions on that and and where where our folks are on that and and provide some information on the efficacy of the vaccine, the efficiency of the vaccine and then um, and then talk about provide some more information about where to go to get it. Uh, I know a lot of us have been my my uh, mom has been trying to get hers this morning and I know a lot of y'all have been 
uh, on that website, and it's been a little frustrating as everybody's clamoring to get a vac vaccination, but yeah, it's worth the wait. So I'm over here, and I'm waiting for somebody to comment and tell me something. Maybe take some courage here. While I'm, while I'm waiting on y'all to comment, I want to uh, point out a couple of books, and, and one is... Uh, one is this book, What Are Biblical Values that we have for EFM? What the Bible Says About Key Ethical Issues. And I'm going to use that as a resource in, in my research for this class. Uh, some, of the, some of the topics in here are right to life. You know, issues around life and the beginning of life. Big one, right? The Bible and gender, another big one for us. Marriage and Family, The Environment, Slavery and Liberation, Social Justice, just a few. Just a few. You know, can we do that safely on here? Can we have discussions safely on here about those things? Uh, and then another book is, I'm going to put this up in um, Amazon here. It's called How Then... Shall We Live? And it's by a Christian ethicist named Sam Wells. Let me see, Sam Wells. Here it is. I'll go over here so y'all can see this. It's a book by Sam Wells. He is a... Um, Christian ethicist from Duke University under Stanley Hauerwas, who was another uh, big, big-time Christian ethicist. And he's, he's from England, and I think he's back in England now and not at Duke anymore. But he's, a, he's got a couple of great books, and this is one of them, and Christian Engagement with Contemporary Issues. Um, and it goes through issues like immigration um, and abortion and some of these other issues that we were talking about. A second ago, but it's another another good resource. Uh, I don't see anybody. Come on, where's the, where y'all at? Come on, what can we say safely? What can we talk about safely? I mean, I'm gonna make a list. I'm gonna make a list. Here we go. Let's see. All right, y'all can keep going in the comment thread if you want to. I'm not gonna delay here and keep y'all longer than you need to be appreciate y'all being a part of this uh, i hope we can have respectful dialogue um, i hope we can open up more spaces to do holy talk this is just one uh, attempt to do that not an easy topic complicity ah as injustice occurs people have been saying this and i'm not sure how to react yeah right i mean that's it's a it's a tough one, right? Um, it's a very tough one to know when silence becomes complicity, uh, because again, a second ago, what Jim said is sometimes what good does talking do? Um, what good does it does it change opinions? It deepens the divide. Uh, silence does something too. It's like a rock in a hard place, right? And you know, I. <laughs> I think that you know you could you could make the argument for activism uh, and altruism that you know doesn't have to use words you know like uh, one of our favorite phrases preach the gospel at all times use words when necessary and so through you know your charitable acts uh, and through your activism and you know what what you're doing in your ministry uh, on a daily basis and the choices that you make the Choices as a consumer that you make, um, you know those those kind of things are a way to not be silent. But I will tell you that probably the most uh, convicting and uh, even say just uh, you know the thing that that weighs on me the most is when I read that Martin Luther King quote about um, his disappointment in the white moderate. Uh, which is still, I think, a phenomenon out there. And, and it doesn't have to be about race in, in particular, but, you know, at that particular time it was, and maybe it still is today, uh, about the moderate, 
uh, sits on the fence and, and kind of waits for things to work themselves out. Um, can we find spaces to be productive and to live out our values and apply our values in ways that are, are constructive and, and don't further the, the divide? Um, and you know, and not be silent. I think I think so. Uh, but I I do feel that, Stacy. I feel that uh, I feel that pressure and that uh, that obligation to say something and and to know to know when it's right to say something and when it's not. Um, and especially you know as a preacher, right? Um, I'm not here to tell anybody how to vote. I'm not here to tell anybody. Uh, what political party to be affiliated with. Uh, I'm here to unify us in Christ and be a part of God's reconciling work in, in the community and in the human family, which for me transcends all of the political stuff and for me um, really is the first concern, first priority. Uh, before these things happen in a political world, they happen in God's world. And and so fi figuring out how to, to speak to it, to speak to these issues from a moral place, from a religious place, is tough too, because it's all going to be interpreted uh, politically, and it's all going to be uh, you know, placed into these, these larger debates that are happening in this. So anyway, I appreciate th your comment, Stacy, and I feel it too. Um, I'm going to keep this comment thread open again uh, for anybody that feels like they want to uh, name an issue that we might talk about together and, and kind of sort out, present all sides fairly, uh, and try to, try to own where we are with these things and um, own our own fears and then listen to each other uh, from a place of empathy. So this is, this is an attempt to do that and... I'm thankful that y'all are on here with me now and hope you can join us for Holy Talk next week at this same time. Next week we will be talking about the vaccine. We'll be giving some information and we'll be talking about, uh, you know, all the uncertainty that comes out, comes with the vaccine rollout and, you know, our society and its uh, participation in that effort. So a lot to talk about. Uh, I love y'all. I want to close us with one more prayer. And uh, this is a prayer for the mission of the church. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Ever living God, whose will it is that all should come to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, inspire our witness to him that all may know the power of his forgiveness and the hope of his resurrection who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, y'all. Thanks. Love y'all. Peace. If you need a priest, you know where to find me.